Welcome to the Psychedelic Passage Podcast. My name is Nick Levich. I'm here with my co-host, Jimmy Wynn. Thank you so much for joining us today. This week, we are talking about one of the other commonly asked questions that we get on a lot of the consultation calls that we take, which is, should I journey solo? Should I journey with my partner? Or should I journey in a group? And it's clear to me that there's pros and cons to all of these. And it's also important to acknowledge that different medicines come from different traditions. And so there's not necessarily a right or wrong way, but it is important to take into consideration uh, what's best for you in your unique situation. And for some people, that's going to be perhaps a more solo oriented journey. And for other people, they may benefit from a more community style application. So we're going to break this down today. And and really where I want to start is just with the understanding that different medicines have different traditions. And so um, if you're going to sit with a medicine like ayahuasca, for instance, it's almost always going to be done in a group, in a community style of container. And we want to focus our discussion today primarily on psilocybin, as that's what most of the clients that we work with uh, choose to journey with. And tends to be kind of the most common entry point for a lot of people into intentional psychedelic use. Yeah, we get this question all the time. And it's actually, it makes sense because it's a really, really important question. If we, as you hear us on this podcast, we emphasize that your service provider, your facilitator, all of that adds into the container of this work. And so the same goes for whether you are considering journeying on your own or with a partner, a friend, a group of people, uh, maybe several like couples of partners get together all the way to even like larger group containers that you typically see in community oriented psychedelic work, retreat centers, you know, things like that. So. I like what you said about distinguishing first and foremost about it being contingent upon the specific medicine or or psychedelic substance that you're using. And then there's also the other parallel of, okay, well, what's going on for you internally, your needs, the content that you have to work on. So we hope that through our episode today, we'll talk through some of those dynamics and and help you to find some tangible actionable you know information to arrive at at your own conclusion you know the the funny thing as you mentioned about like ayahuasca and then I don't want to like derail our conversation too too much cuz I know that I tend to do that but there's some medicines that are rooted in very very deep tradition and lineage and culture and even amongst those different lineages and traditions and cultures there can be some variation especially around group settings how many people how many porters are there per the group with psilocybin it's actually this country you know the united states it's a little bit different a to your point psilocybin is just more prevalent it's more available it, it it does grow naturally you know in the pacific northwest and in areas you know all all across the country so we we find folks who are able to essentially source you know psilocybin and medicines more available it's just more available and so you run into this dynamic on okay well who do i have around me who do i journey with what does that look like and i would also add that timing, you know, kind of plays into that, you know, a little bit too. And so orienting this to psilocybin, I do believe that many folks kind of view this from a solo experience. I think that that comes from the clinical trials and research and some of those things where that's, where that's primarily in a, like a solo format with supporters and service providers around you. And then I'll also share that there is a lot of efficacy around journeying with a partner, journeying in groups, and it really, really varies. So what would you tell somebody, Nick, as far as the first criteria of, of, of thinking about this, of solo or, or partner or group? Well, I think the most important thing is just to acknowledge that whether you believe like w- whatever your personal belief system is when you're in an altered state and you're in a container with another person there's this energetic enmeshment that occurs and so whether it's your facilitator whether it's your friend whether it's your partner whether it's a stranger like 
you're you become hyper aware of their energy their presence their uh influence in the space that you're cohabitating together and so that could either be really really beneficial or very very distracting and nerve-wracking and so you know considerations that i take into uh, account for instance would be something like social anxiety and this is what prevents people, a lot of people that I talk to from going on international retreats is because they're like, well, I don't want to show emotion in front of 15 strangers that are also going through a journey together. And I've just met these people and I'm going to be in my most vulnerable state in front of them. That's common in the international retreat format is, is for there to be much larger groups, even though the medicine is psilocybin. And what we tend to get a lot of requests for are more solo one-on-one -on -one, like one facilitator to one journeyer type of containers or like a hey you know my wife and i both want to do this should we do it together or not and so uh, that's what i tend to see a lot but it's important that we make this point very clear you know we talk about containers jimmy stresses it a lot but what we're talking about here is the space that you're cohabitating and just understanding that that in this hyper state of awareness you're very much picking up on these these subtle energies that you may not be aware of in your default way of going through life. Yeah, so the first thing I hear from you is getting really clear on your needs, your boundaries. Probably by an extension of that is getting honest with yourself about your intentions and the content and the things that might come the up. Question, the question that I would ask if I were the journeyer is, in what type of space am I going to feel like I can let my walls down? Mm -hmm. And you may decide for some person that may be, oh, that's with my partner. And for other people that may be like, oh, I need to go solo. Like I can't have anyone besides my facilitator bear witness to this. And that's totally okay. It's not a right or a wrong. Mm -hmm. But that question of like, what is going to allow you to let the walls down? What is that setup is going to be really, really important. Yeah. I really want to highlight something super important that you are talking about, which I'll, I'll phrase it as this sensitivity to presence, like the sensitivity to other people's energies and presence, which is a part of it is physical proximity. But I just want to illuminate some examples of how sensitive this, this might be. So I've had clients who maybe live in a place with like shared walls or with, um, you know, like a neighbor or something like that. And it's very clear, even though the neighbor or the person has no idea that an experience is happening, it's very clear that their like energetics are like added into the space. And then we find out later that, oh, the journey has had a conflict with this, with this neighbor and then you hear a so they drop something or a pounding on the wall or something like that accidentally and then those things spill in into the container i actually have a really really funny example i was doing my own solo journey uh was deeply in a somatic experience nick i've actually told you this story before i randomly get a text from somebody and the text from somebody is like hey are you showing up to this thing i left my laptop can you like so and so and it was totally the wrong text, not intended for me at all. And I messaged back the person. And I'm like, hey, I think this is a wrong text. I'm actually journeying right now. So like just wanted to get back to you. And their reply was somewhat uh, br brushing it off. They're like, haha, my mistake. Very, very innocently, like one text came through. It adjusted the course of my experience, just even having that you know, interaction with somebody. And so to think that one text message could like one sigh, one, right. one, one yeah. deep breath, one, one person just being just bothered enough or like yeah. any of these little things, like you will pick up on it. Mm -hmm. One piece of body language, one piece of nonverbal communication, you know, maybe you, um, you know, make eye contact and, and there's, you know, something that is, is, not feeling aligned there, you know? And so I, I use these somewhat silly examples just to highlight that we're talking about something that's somewhat intangible, but, but it has some real implications to 
the ceremony of the experience. Well, and we've all had the experience of getting into a room and it maybe feels comforting because you know everyone there and you've got this nice rapport and there's no elephant you know in the room or dust in your relationship whatever the case is and then alternatively getting into a room and you're like "Ooh, i don't belong here and and so that's the kind of like um energetic piece that we're talking about only it's magnified like a hundred x because you are <laughs> <Probably> even more <laughs> yeah yeah um, and more. so solo, the benefit to me to solo is that it provides the fewest inputs, right? So it's just you and your facilitator or trip sitter guide, whatever term you want to use here. But, but, you know, as you probably know, if you've listened to the show for a while, Jimmy and I definitely highly advise being supported in your journey. And so when we're talking about solo here, I'm referring to kind of one-on-one -on -one, you and a guide solo, meaning you're the only journeyer. Um, but it's important that you pick the right guide because their energy is also right. in the container. And so, you know, if you've hear, heard us talk about a guide with a clean slate, what we mean is someone who's not infusing their own needs, wants, desires, beliefs into your experience. In other words, it's non-directive. Yeah. And I'll add, just to encapsulate what you were saying earlier, that once you identify your needs and what you're comfortable with, then you got to go and check and see what's possible. So especially in group settings, you have to check with yourself. How, how comfortable am I in or, or am I in walking into a ceremony and maybe not having met everybody already? Is that important to me? Is it important that I've at least met everybody, whether you're a journeyer or a facilitator? And then you got to check and see what's possible, because if you're going on an international retreat, there may be some privacy issues at play. Well, maybe there's, you know, 30 to 40 people in in that, you know, retreats uh, setting. And so you may not be able to schedule a 20 minute meeting with everybody to connect. That just may not be possible. And so I think in addition to getting clear on on your needs it's also just important to check like what your options are and i'll also say that it's 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 a little bit of a different dynamic even in a group like let's just say you're working with five or six different people even if you know everybody there's still a lot more to consider around whether everybody whether the container is is appropriate for every part participant there because everybody's journey is different as well so if you do have let's say a partner a friend group of people whether it's several different couples like coming together i've seen a lot of these dynamics play out because everybody's at their own place with their own decision making and everybody's at their own place and their openness and, and willingness to so you may have five out of six people who are like Yup, I'm ready to go deep. I'm ready to be vulnerable. I'm ready to, you know, address whatever's there. And you might have that one person who's like, I'm not comfortable with that. Or they're oriented recreationally. They're like, I've journeyed a hundred times and I just want to eat this, this dose of mushrooms and you all can do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Ah, so it's, it's even the way that the person is approaching the second. Oh, I mean, I've, I've seen like this. I've, I've had people reach out. They're like, Hey, we're doing this bachelor party and, you know, we've known each other for 10 years and we want to do a intentional group journey. And what's really interesting is I would say nine out of 10 times a larger group approaches us. It falls apart at some stage in the process before we even get right. to the ceremony because there's such a mismatch of how people are entering it. And so just because you know each other as friends doesn't mean that you're well suited to all journey together because of these varying levels of intentionality commitment to the process desire to go deep all of those types of factors yeah let me let me illuminate this further i i totally this is a great example to to use this this anecdote here i think first and foremost there's there's one person who was kind of the point person for for this group and i think it was first and foremost, getting really clear on their needs. Do you want a trip sitter? Like somebody to just show up and just like make sure that you're okay from a harm reduction standpoint. 
Are you looking for more of a facilitated experience? Are you looking more for a guided experience? Like, what is it? And then what Nick and I did was we just chatted with everybody. We're like, okay, well, let's just get on individual calls with everybody to see where everybody's at and just see what happens. We got all the way to the point. I forget if it was this group or another. But we got all the way to the point where people were like making payments and making their deposits and they were all committed. There was all this stuff happening. And then it slowly started to unravel. Like one person was like, oh, I'm not sure. Let me actually like, mm, I'm going to bow out of this. And then that gave other people this almost space to be like, oh, maybe I'm not sure either. And what we arrived at was that out of the group, everybody was viewing the thing differently. Everybody had different needs. They were, they were expecting different things. They wanted different outcomes. Like, And so it's really, really important to get aligned with, with all of those things. Yeah. And so... I think groups are the trickiest, frankly. Yeah. Uh, for facilitators, for journeyers, uh, and 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 the pro, the 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 upside to a group is this whole community aspect because there's this there's this kind of bond that forms when you go through a collective experience like that that transcends the mind and language and what we know to be the human experience. And when you share that with someone, there is a special connection that's created because you've you've connected in a level that's like much more soul oriented. You've stripped away all of the facade and you've, you've um, journeyed together in a level of vulnerability that some people never experience in their whole life. And so to me, that's the upside to the communal piece, but it can just as easily go the other direction if the sanctity of that container is not upheld. Yeah. For example, are you, go are you okay if, let's say out of your group of six people, three or four people are actually going through a challenging portion all at the same time. And maybe you actually just have two facilitators there. Are you okay for giving a little bit of space for other folks to get supported? Or do you need somebody who is just giving their undivided attention and support to you because that that's what you're, what you're looking for? So there, there's no right or wrong there. But I think some of these considerations are important and if you are if you are considering journeying with a group if it's a group of people that you know then i really invite you all to have these types of conversations how open and willing are we to bring our walls down here together in this safe container so it's funny because this also came up in a group where these people were like we know each other we tell each other everything okay Come to find out, they weren't. There were there were folks that weren't fully transparent with other members of the group of their medications, and so then in the screening process, it came out that some folks got cleared and some folks didn't, and that got awkward mm -hmm. because uh, you say that you all know each other and you're friends, but there's actually topics that are off limits, so to speak, in your normal friendship. And once the screening process, uh, like basically a very awkward conversation ensued Ooh. because some people, quote unquote, made the cut and some didn't. And it's it, that's the kind of transparency and openness and honesty that's required for those group style formats. Mm. And if you don't have that already, this can really illuminate some stuff that maybe, you know, you weren't prepared to have out in the open. Wow, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's that, you know i'm really grateful to hear that that conversation happened because it sounds like okay that needed to come to the surface for people to get on the same page i'm also internally cringing on how awkward that probably was oh yeah Ooh. yeah oh yeah oh, yeah and man. so and so this is the interesting thing because we casually say things like oh we know everything about each other uh, we all have a shadow side. We all have this stuff that exists, that stuff that we don't want to reveal to other that, people. Exactly. We don't want to show that. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps I, I think we've done a good job of highlighting the group thing. And so maybe yeah. we switch over into like, you know, partners, couples, yeah. significant others, because this For is sure. definitely the most common request that we get is like, you know, uh, a husband and wife or, or, you know, a partnership where they're cohabitating, they're intimate, they're, you know, an item, so to speak. And yeah, they're, they're always like, well, should we journey alone or together? And once again, there's considerations that have to be thought through here. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think we should do an episode around this also, even for people who aren't even considering journeying together, because there's there's a whole dynamic that happens when one. Oh, yeah. So what's the table of action? Yeah. For yeah for another but, one. but I think that we can talk about some like considerations here and then maybe the audience would just view this as like a teaser to, to a, a future episode. And so the first thing that I'll share is that it really, really depends on the content of what you're wanting to work through. And I think that there's a difference between the intention. So if you are, let's say a, you're in a relationship and if your intent is to work on your relationship, maybe there's things that you're unhappy with. Maybe there's things that you, you know, do not journey together. Caution. Proceed <laughs> with caution. Because then I ask, okay, well, how much of this work are you doing outside of ceremony? Do you have open, healthy communication? Do you, are you maybe in relationship or couples therapy? Are there things that you're doing to create a healthy environment already? For you to express your feelings, emotions, and needs, because if you don't, forget about moving into a ceremony, trying to do any of that well, stuff. Yeah, and then we have to factor in that a lot of times the issues in relationship actually stem from unhealed wounds it within us. And so there's this like relationship external focus, but the the, the medicine often orients inwards towards you. And so I always caution against if if the goal, if the shared intentionality is to work on your relationship, personally, I recommend soloing, uh, solo journeys first. Like, like, look underneath your own hood before you start pointing fingers and trying to, to analyze what's going on in the relationship because that also sets it up for a very tricky container where you've already got this this friction in your relationship and then you're stepping into this like extremely vulnerable state where you don't know what's going to come up and you're no longer in control yeah yeah i'll clarify that nick what i believe you're saying and you, you could tell me if i'm hearing you right or not i don't think you're being prescriptive here i'm not saying I, I don't hear you saying yes or no what i hear you saying is be really thoughtful and careful around this and it's important to not put the reliance upon ceremony together if you're not doing this type of work in regular life. Yeah, I also think it has the potential to make things a lot worse. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so, because the other interesting thing that happens when we journey with a significant other is we often have the tendency to alleviate their suffering. And yeah. there's this subconscious lifeline effect that occurs where if I spend the whole journey worrying about my significant other and how she's doing, I never actually get into my own work. And yeah, so it's, oh, so it's very easy to get super distracted by what's going on with the other person that it's it's almost like a defense mechanism that for keeps sure. you from actually sorting through whatever's coming up for you. Yeah, you're in my head because I wanted to bring this up where I think what you're saying applies regardless of whether you're in a relationship or you're journeying with a friend or you're in a group or whatnot. And and the way that I describe it to my clients when we talk about our ground rules and we talk about, you know, the the rules within the container, one thing that I share, and I think you do this too, is I tell them, do not worry or focus about my needs as a facilitator exactly i'm autonomous i'll take care of myself the reason why short of like hospitality there's many many clients who are just very hospitable you know you're in the space they want to make sure you're taken care of like fully good but the moment that it becomes a distraction the moment it becomes a mechanism for you to not focus on the present is where it can be dicey and so what i share with folks is that there's fight flight or freeze there's a fourth f which is called fawning. And what fawning means is that as a mechanism, you are caring about somebody's needs, almost sacrificial to yourself. I think about like, sadly, like Bambi's mom, right? <laughs> when, when, when I like think about this. And so look, that's... And it not, comes up way more commonly way than you might expect. A lot. Way more. And that's not always... I don't want to classify this as good or bad. I'm just saying that this is a dynamic and it's a thing. And so... If a journeyer has a likelihood of fawning over the needs of their facilitator, imagine what's going to happen if it's, 
your friend or your partner or your spouse or whatnot. Um, regardless of whether it's your best and they're having a super physical somatic release with shaking and tears and convulsing and you're like what is happening to this person and you're also in an altered state it's super confusing you're not sure whether they're okay or not like you can see how this very quickly spirals into a situation where it's actually not conducive to either party even though they're totally fine in their process it's just what's happening yeah and then maybe let's say the facilitator is paying some attention to focus to them, which makes you feel like you don't have time and space to express your own needs and your own stuff and process. And so this can just get entangled, I think, really, very, really, quickly. really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that's super important. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that you have to have the same intentions and the same content and the same work. I think that there needs to be some real honest discussion about navigating that though together. Right. Because I we have I've facilitated for for couples, I'm sure you have too, and mm -hmm. they've been some very profound, beautiful journeys, but there was a mutual understanding that we're gonna be like separately internal. Right. right. So so like there's a sh they don't they have different intentions and it's not related to their relationship. But there's a shared understanding that we're going to be going inward into our own respective worlds as we journey. We'll be in the same space. We'll feel each other's presence. But this isn't about coddling each other. It's not about fixing each other. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it, it, there's still this like very uh, welcomed sense of autonomy, of independence, of personal sovereignty, despite journeying together. Yeah, there's. Uh, I hear you kind of noting upon codependence there, which again, that can probably be a, a whole conversation <laughs> in itself. But I I think that it is an important point that you are are making here. And, you know, we're talking about some of the considerations that, that you should have in journeying with anybody, which this then segues into something that I, that I know that we both wanted to bring up as well. Look, there can be the opposite of that. Like you might actually be like, hey, actually having this person in the room helps me drop in deeper. It helps me have this tether of trust and safety. This person sees me in a way that nobody else sees me. And like, I actually need that. That all obviously should happen with consent and with care and with the plan and, and all that. So we're just, we're just highlighting the the nuance here and, 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 conveying this in a way in our dialogue so that you know that you have options because it's actually way more than solo versus a group versus a part. It, it's more than that. And so some things that I suggest to folks in this theme of giving folks options, I think there's considerations on whether you journey together. I've done plenty of experiences where folks actually journey back to back. Like I've done one, that as well. One person, one person journeys one day, the next person journeys the other day. And then e even you have to decide on whether you want the other person present in your space or not, or whether they go off and kind of step out for, for the day. And so this brings up this whole thought about, you know, considerations around other people being in the room, in the container, in the ceremonial space who maybe aren't journeying. And so... I'll put a little asterisk here to say that in some specific traditions around medicine work, it can be pretty common for even like facilitators and space holders to also journey depending on dosage and stuff like that. I'm saying an asterisk because that's kind of irrelevant to our, our conversation today. Obviously, that's not super legal in, in our, our country, you know, right now. But I think what we're talking about here is... What if I'm journeying, but I want, let's say, my best friend, or maybe there's a parent who's involved to, you know, somebody who's of legal age, but a little bit younger, like, do you even want them in the space? So I wonder your, your thoughts around that, Nick. I'm usually very hesitant when I get this request. And my number one, my first question is why? Why do you want them there? Like, what is it about this? Because this is where we get into this kind of a lot of times the codependency and the subconscious lifeline shows up and what this does, and I'm not saying this in all cases, but a lot of times if that's what's happening here, um, it reinforces this, this story, this belief that I don't know if I can do this on my own. 
and I actually need to to rely on other people to help dig me out of here. And that's nothing against support. It has to do with a level of autonomy and ownership over your situation that, you know, you can get yourself out with support, but not necessarily having someone to do it for you. And here's a really important distinction. It depends on the role that that person plays in your life because a facilitator, one of the beautiful benefits of it is that they have less bias about you. They have neutral. less stake in your life. They're, they they should just by nature just be more neutral. Like they don't have uh, proverbially a dog in the fight besides, you know, like supporting you. And so if you go through something deep, if you if something comes up that nobody else knows, well, great, that facilitator can hold that space for you. But if it's your best friend who views you in a certain way, if it's your partner who views you in a certain way, if it's your sibling who views you in a certain way, if it's your parent who views you in a certain way, it's really, really hard to be And then we get back to this thing of and then we get back to this thing of how do they relate to your suffering, your discomfort, your struggle, or your beauty, your divination, your 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 communion with God. Can they hold all that? And yep. so and 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 the irony is that this is why people hire a professional guide or a facilitator is because they want someone who can hold all that. And then you turn around and infuse someone into the space who has no idea what they're doing. It muddies the waters. And this is that energetic enmeshment piece that I think is so, so, so important to highlight. Yeah, I share with folks that even the people who know about your experience, but they're not there physically in the space, their concern can influence your experience. So if you have a spouse or a partner or a friend, maybe you told your friend group and they're not even, they just know like the day that's happening. They're going through their day, worrying, freaking out, wondering if you're safe. Want to guess what? All that worry and all that stuff is going to come into the space. Then imagine what's going to happen if that person was actually in the room oh, and yeah. you're having a somatic experience and they're concerned about you. Then, yep. then they're looking to the facilitator. Then maybe the facilitator has to take some time to reassure that person. And so I, I think that's, that's really, really I- important. And, um, you know, I, I think about having somebody else in the room who isn't journeying. It's really, really contextual, like what you said about kind of this line of, of, of dialogue where you were kind of noting, well, I don't know what might come up. I just need somebody to maybe like kind of rescue me if some shit comes up. And then the first thing I'm thinking of is like, well, are you clear on what might potentially come up or not? You know? Right. And so I'll share, I'll share that just to really, really make a concrete, concrete example here. There's a difference internally between what you're talking about, Nick, on the why you want somebody there. I'll share this anecdote that I had a client who wanted their mental health professional present. And that was a person who obviously wasn't journeying. They were not, you know, doing any medicine and they're in the space and I had to get really clear on the why. So even somebody who's a professional supporter, I'm still asking the why and what's the intent and what's the, and then I'm checking with that person. Are you able to hold a neutral grounded presence? How do you view psychedelics? How are you looking at this? How how would you navigate this if somebody was, you know, uh, going through a challenging, difficult, you know, overwhelming time. Because if you're a journeyer and there's someone in your space, regardless of your relationship to them or who they are, and they're holding the frequency of, oh my God, this is scary. I don't know if this is going to be okay. You will feel it. There is no question about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And alternatively, if everyone that's in the space is holding the frequency of this is all perfect, this is all beautiful, it's unfolding exactly how it's supposed to, you'll feel that. And so how people show up, it doesn't even matter what they're saying. It's quite literally the 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 energetics behind their physical presence in your space, or even what I hear you saying, which is their lack of physical presence, but how they um, you know, energetically do or don't support your journey all impacts your experience. And yeah. and so I wanna I wanna highlight that a lot of times what we see after we work through that line of questioning, hey, I have a friend who is my best friend and I want her in the space and and we go through this whole process, a lot of times we arrive at the outcome of either they're in the home but not in the room Mm -hmm. or they're just out and and just simply knowing that they support you is enough. 
mm-hmm. for that. Journey. Like on on call, exactly. I do this very commonly where myself as a facilitator, I offer is like, hey, do you want me to send some text updates? Like not about any content, but just to reassure this person, or maybe that person is uh, like a mile away or just like down the block or something and, and can be there if, if needed. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can figure out the logistics and, and the implementation. Uh, right. I do want to share that, that just to reiterate that one of the really cool things, if it's a good setup to journey with your partner, if you go through that internal, um, exploration and decide that that's a good idea, it's, it can be a very beautiful experience, mm-hmm. like incredibly profound, a level of bonding and connection that is is oftentimes unavailable to us when we have our defense mechanisms, our ego, our conditioning all in the way. Um, and that same kind of rapport can exist in that back to back journey day kind of things, because you're still so raw and so vulnerable. And there's a sense of understanding for what the other person went through. You may not know what content came up, but just an understanding that you both went through that journey uh, can be very empowering in a relationship. And so just because you don't journey together doesn't mean that it doesn't positively impact your relationship. I think there's there's an immense amount of potential benefit to be had regardless of how you structure it. Yeah. I want to give a very specific word of caution here, especially around the, the partner or couple's relationship thing. And then it's very clear to me that we need more episodes about this. So we'll follow up on maybe an episode specific around, uh, you know, couples and partners journeying together. And then even an episode about just support, like like spousal support. Right, exactly. So I think that that's really important. But whether you are a friend or in a romantic relationship or, or whatnot, it's also important the length and the depth of that relationship. It Because psychedelics... More this this can be more specific to things like MDMA and whatnot, but even with psilocybin, it increases empathy, it increases connection with folks in, in some instances and cases. And so that can get really blurry if let's say you're in a new relationship or if you are in like a new friendship and then some of the things- Or even abusive or in a toxic relationship. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But then you but then you see like the the light in this person. It doesn't mean it's embodied. They could be operating from a totally different mm-hmm. side of themselves, but it but it, it it definitely shows up there as well. Yeah. Then it becomes really hard to separate out, okay, what are my feelings? Like how do I feel about this person and this relationship or the thing? Versus maybe this was like a, a flood of serotonin and oxytocin that that comes up from a psychedelic experience that that temporarily makes me more connected, more aligned, or or more. And so there's, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm I'm just bring, I'm just bringing this up for anybody who is considering journeying with but any this type is, of this is perfect other. because I wanna I wanna bring this back to kind of where I started, which is. Solo provides the cleanest slate because it's the least inputs. Yeah. It's just you. Yeah. And I think if it's your first time exploring this type of work, that probably is going to be uh, make the most sense because mm-hmm. you're limiting these external factors for exactly what you're describing, which is the lines getting blurred. Is this mine or is it yours? And this is the same reason that people ask, well, you know, why in your prep recommendations do you do you suggest abstaining from sexual activities in the week before it's not because sex is bad it's because sex is union it's it's this divine union into you know oneness and it becomes very hard to separate out what's yours and what's mine and so that's Mm -hmm. the the intention behind abstinence and then and then you know more of a solo orientation is that it's just you it becomes very clear what's yours and what's not yeah I'll add one last thing. I know I said that about before, but I will add one actual last thing and then we can wrap up this episode where I just also acknowledge that what's possible depends on your financial situation, your economic situation, what time you have available, which we'll we'll talk about a little bit in in the in the next episode. But I just acknowledge that if you're doing one-on-one work that is more um i would call like a boutique type of service where there's one person fully paying attention to you sometimes that can come at a higher like program price or a higher you know whatnot maybe you can only afford 
a group setting within a within a particular budget and whatnot. So I'm I'm just I'm just noting that I I know it's not as simple as identifying your needs and then going out and then finding a service provider who can meet those needs. My point in saying this is that you have to decide what are non-negotiable needs versus needs that can be navigated. And so the social anxiety example is huge. Like if you have social anxiety, likely you're not going to sign up for a group setting, even if it's, you know, X, Y, Z cheaper or whatnot. And so just do that internal check with yourself. What's the most important for me to feel like I have a safe and sacred container that can hold my shit essentially? Yep. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job covering this. Yeah. Is there anything else that, that no, I feel good. I feel called to add here? Feeling complete here. Okay, cool. Well, thank you all for listening today. I think that was a nice juicy topic that addressed a question that we get a lot of. I hope it's helpful for all of you. Uh, that brings us to the end of our episode today. You can find all of our episodes, uh, on any major streaming platform, Apple podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever else you may get your podcast. If you like the show, we would always appreciate a rating, a subscription, share with anyone uh, that you think would benefit. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.